Yeah, hey, um, hi everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm Ricky Olson. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, the Missile Defense Advocacy Alliance. We've been around since uh, 2001. I've been around missile defense maybe as long as Martin Green has. Um, all the way back to 1980 with, uh, with President Reagan. But um, we're here today, and I know the focus of the world right now is on North Korea. And it's, it's pretty satisfying to know that we have capability that's in play today um, that we've invested in, we've tested in, and it's working uh, in terms of creating stability in that situation today. So every one of our territories, every one of our states, Japan, and as soon as that becomes operational, which is pretty close to becoming operational over there, the, the, the population of probably about 500 million people will be have uh, a defense and a deterrent on that. But the other side of the world is where we're going to focus on because the other side of the world um, has has gaps uh, in capability and in capacity on air on air defense. And um, as we as we look at missile defense. You know, missile defense evolved. Uh, our Army missile defense and Patriots were really morphed into our ballistic, I mean, excuse me, our air defense. The Patriots were morphed into our into our uh, ballistic missile defense, and eventually took. Uh, you know, we have six, fifteen uh, battalions. That's fifteen battalions of it. But back in the day, we had 15, 16 short range battalions, short range missile defense battalions attached to each one of our, our divisions. And today, we have a tremendous gap of not having uh, air defense uh, capability uh, for maneuvering forces in, in Europe. And Europe has, uh, has seen the Ukraine crisis, as, as, as we know, I think a lot of you read the Carver paper, but Russia demonstrated a use of UAS uh, and a use of, of uh, UAVs to, to take out tank battalions very quickly. And Russia has taken advantage of our lack of investment in air defense over the past decade and has got an advantage uh, in the air uh, on, on maneuvering force. So we've been over uh, to Europe several times uh, this year. We've been uh, exposed to it. Um, we've been over to Crete uh, for the testing. Uh, last two years, we've lost probably 150 missiles to be fired off of that, both air and both missile defense. And um, we've helped uh, bring this issue uh, to bearing uh, with, with, our, with our forces over there and with our allies over there. So, you know, we're very fortunate today to have a couple experts here that can talk to the issue. Um, and it's important because if we cannot protect our maneuvering forces, we don't have a deterrent in there. And that is probably the number one thing we're trying to do is to get our three, I think there are three combat brigade teams in Europe. One's, one's uh, uh, comes over and uh, transient and, and the other two are permanent. But that's a critical piece for us to, 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 to come up with a capability uh, that's effective to do it. Um, Last, this past Friday, uh, we down-selected, the, the Army has addressed this, this issue and uh, had an open competition uh, with the best solution to be able to protect the maneuvering force. And this last Friday, they down-selected probably uh, somewhere there's 10 or, 12, 10 or 12 different solutions that were put forward on the table. And in October, we're going to be able to see which is the best solution and they're gonna make a decision on, on, on that. And I, you know, we would love to see it project uh, more than, less than three years from now when you have the ability to field. So that, that's something that, that's really the PEO office over in, in, in Alabama that's gonna have to be efficient and have to be able to move forward with this as quick as possible. And I believe today, General Miley and has addressed the situation by putting forward our Avenger and our Stinger capability as a, as a solution 
uh, with what we've got now, but that solution obviously is, is, is an old uh, 1970s type solution that has some limits on its capability. So there is, an, there is a sense of urgency to be able to get this solution uh, picked and get the solution in the field as, as quick as we can to do that. Um, we were fortunate because the National Guard uh, got, when, when, when the U.S. Army uh, left or moved away from its air defense capability in Shoraz, they gave most of it uh, to, to the National Guard. We, we only have, the U.S. Army only has, I think, two uh, battalions, one, one uh, 55 five out of Fort Hood that supports the, the, the Korea mission um, over there at Humphrey. And then we have the one in, uh, at the 82nd Airborne, and that's all the U.S. Army has. So they're, they're, they're reliant uh, on our National Guard, who has the mission um, for, our, for the capital region, and the National Guard has the mission for defending the homeland. So this is a, this is a big, big uh, priority, I think, for, for the National Guard on, on moving on. So it, it also, I think, is a, is a win-win for us, but we have to also enable our allies and the NATO allies to, to help resource it, help with, with uh, manning it and so forth because we, we can't do this alone. And I think you're going to see some big things that are happening. Um, I think you're going to see for the first time ever, you're going to see an integrated exercise in July uh, out, out in Romania. The, the, the Brook exercise is going to come forward and that may be our first opportunity to have a, a, a synchronized uh, integrated air and missile defense uh, total with, with 22 of our, our NATO allies in play with, with that. And we also got to remember that, that not just uh, the shooter is important, it's the sensors that are very important to be able to pick everything up and we have to be able to you know, be integrated with it, be able to talk to, to other systems from other countries to get a very clear uh, picture uh, on that. We know that, that NATO has the Global Response Force that has to be protected as well as our, as our free combat brigade uh, teams that are, that are over there. Um, one more little thing is just, you know, missile, you know we've been <coughs> focused, I think, on, on port operating basic protection. So we've been developing technologies and so forth, for, like MPIC and so forth, for, for point defense, uh, port operation. We've been developing our, our Patriot and SAD systems for, for area defense, but there hasn't been that development or investment in a, in a maneuvering force capability. And we still have to have uh, capability of ballistic missile defense and, and port operating bases for logistical support for fueling areas and so forth, again, collectively uh, to make our deterrent better than it is today and, and to be able to uh, you know, stabilized situations that, 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 that are not going to be stabilized if one side is, has more capability than the other side in terms of uh, air superiority. So I think uh, it's an exciting mission. I think we'll, we've got some great solutions coming forward, and uh, I think it's timely. So I'd like to introduce my, my first speaker here, um, <coughs> to Glenn, Major General Glenn Bromwell. We've, we've been together in a lot of places, uh, trust to Israel. Uh, uh, been with him and, and, and seen him uh, lead. He, he is the leader of the 263rd National Guard. They're, they are in charge of the defense, the air defense of the National Capital Region, and he is in charge of, uh, of moving his Avengers and, and supporting uh, the European um, uh, ISU and, and so forth there. So he, he's an expert at, at this field. He's not set up here. Go ahead. Thank you, Ricky. Um, when, I, when I talk about air defense, I like to start off with uh, with a statement that actually came out of the end of World War II, and it really defines how our business should be conducted and how our business should be conducted in the future. And of course, you know, you know, at the end of World War II, we dominated the airspace, and we dominated the airspace over the European theater and over the Pacific theater. So General Carl Spatz, who's an Air Force guy, he says. And it's really a, if you think about what he's saying, he's saying it from the point of the victor and also the point from the defeated. A 
but it's also something we need to be aware of and also to keep at our forefront for the view to do. So he said, if you don't dominate the sky and airspace above you, be prepared to be buried in the earth beneath you. Dominate the sky or be defeated. And of course, you know, if, if you look at the history of, of, of everything, especially within the, the U.S. military, you know, we've always had a, had a domination. But sometimes it really didn't start off like that, but usually then because of technology and the way that we would find solutions to it. Going back through the Korean War, of course, you know, it didn't start off very well. But towards the end, with the help of the Air Force and the help of the triple H systems, again, we dominated the airspace. Really, in Vietnam, we ran into issues because the, 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 um, the, the uh, North Vietnamese learned that if I dominate my airspace, then I'm able to defeat the, the, air, the air forces of others. And so when they developed their, their missile systems around Hanoi, you know, they used what Carl Spad said. If I don't dominate the space, then I can't win. So we, we learn to countermeasure other people's ability to dominate. And I know during the Israeli wars, they learned this, this trick. They learned how to do it. You know, when the Egyptians introduced the, the SAMs into the airspace, all of a sudden the Israeli Air Force had a very serious problem, something they never, they never had to worry about in the past. But then they learned the countermeasures to defeat what the Israelis were, were, what the Egyptians were trying to do was dominate the airspace. So if you look at where we are today, um, you can really see the last two, two wars we've had in Iraq and Afghanistan have, have really, we've, we've concentrated more on the Air Force dominating the airspace because the Air Force did not have anyone that would challenge them. And so when it came time for the U.S. to, to really look at how they can enable the ground force, they looked at how do we do a surge in both these theaters. And when they looked at a surge in theaters, they looked at what forces are not being utilized. And of course, if the airspace is dominating the airspace, then really your air defenders are being used for uh, convoys, for security. So the Army made a decision um, right or wrong, to take 14,000 air defenders and turn them into a surge force. And he pulled this force out of the shore ad, which is the short range, because it was a system that wasn't there. It wasn't needed. When you looked at back in the 80s and early 90s, when the Soviets were still a power, you know, we need this force in Europe, because this force was a deterrent against from aviation against the Soviet forces. But with the advent, when the wall came down, guess what, we did not have a peer. We did not have a near peer. And so senior leadership said, right or wrong, that because of this event, that we will never have a near peer. And because of the domination of our Air Force, guess what, we don't need certain weapon systems. And so Shurad pretty much took the blunt of a successful Air Force, and took no near fear. So 14,000 soldiers were taken and turned into infantry, into armor, into other, other forces that were needed, especially within those two theaters. So, along comes the Russians and Ukraine. And if you've had a chance to look at the Potomac study, and see what happened to the Ukrainian forces against the Russians. The Ukrainians were not able to defend their airspace. The Russians were using very successful UASs, long-range artillery. They dominated Ukrainian airspace. And in part of the study, and this was something that uh, General Hodges brought to us as a senior leadership, and it was nothing but pictures and pictures of burned out Ukrainian vehicles. And the bottom line said the airspace was dominated by somebody else. And the very last slide, and one that I, that I used up in, uh, when I was over in Israel, 
the fact that the last slide says coming to a theater near you. So this is a thing that could happen if you don't learn what General Spatz told us to do. You've got to dominate the airspace. You've got to command the airspace above your soldiers. So in Europe right now, we're running into the same issue because guess what? We have a near peer. We have the Russians. And the Russians have never, ever gone away. They just decided to take a step back, rebuild force, look at the way they do their, their techniques and procedures, and they came out very strong. And so working with General Hodges, you know, we had to come up with a solution. You know, how can we get the force back there? What is the force that is needed? And during a, uh, a senior leader meeting with the uh, vice chief of the army, he came out with a simple question. He said, whatever happened to our Shurad force and where is it now? And of course, senior leaders, the way they are, they, they come up with this, a, a holistic approach. Well, sir, you know, um, holistically, this is what we're doing. You know, to me, I hate to say it, but uh, if you've ever seen the movie Shawshank Redemption, when he asked Red, you know, do you feel you've been rehabilitated? And he said, I don't know the meaning of that word. Well, to me, holistic is a word you throw out there when you have no answer. You know, it's a war college phrase. It's the holistic approach. My dog eats holistic food. So there is no answer. The only capability that we have for sure, Ed, you know, right now the purpose of Shorad, besides what we use in the national capital, is an enabler for the ground force. It allows the ground force, controls the airspace, and defeats the enemy over our, over our ground forces to allow our maneuver force to do what maneuver force is needed to. And so right now, there are seven battalions of, of Shorad, and it's all within the National Guard. And we do rotations through the NCR, we do rotations, now we're starting to do some rotations in Europe right now, I'm getting a battery ready, plus part of our brigade piece to go over there to provide a shore at force for our maneuver force. But it's been a long time coming, and, and if you look at air defense, air defense really is it's a triad, because you have your short range, your medium range, and then your long range, which is your bad, and your patriot, and your shore at. So if you take away one of those legs on this stool, you have a stool that cannot stand. Because it's really sure ad that protects your other assets. It protects your logistics. It, protect, it protects your bad systems. And pretty much it's gonna protect your Patriot system too. But right now we only have seven battalions and they're working on solutions for us. I had the privilege of, of um, being at Ramstein back in December at the International Fires Conference. And the speaker of the conference was the commanding general of the Ukrainian rocket and artillery force. And he came up with something that he thought was just, just totally different and new. He said, you know what? He said, we have changed the way we do business. Now we maneuver all the time and we are able to maybe shoot one or two batteries, but we move and we move and we move. And there was a a British colonel next to me, and he said, whatever happened to mass? You know, we're supposed to mass artillery. And I turned to him, I said, they found out real quick, if I stop the mass, if I don't dominate my skies, I die. And so his concept of moving is not new, but it's something he's doing because it's survivability for them. And so with the end, and, and Thanks to General Milley and, and people like General Hodges who, who are now seeing the, the purpose and why we need Shorat back in force. I mean, there, there, is a, there is a big push to get this back because they know that it's, it what protects, it is part of this three-legged stool. But I need this, this, this capability so if we ever get in trouble in Europe that we've been able to protect our maneuver force while our maneuver force is is engaged to destroy the enemy. Because if not, then on our epitaph, it's going to be the words of General Call Spats. If you don't dominate your airspace, then be prepared to be buried in the earth below. Thank you, John. Um, 
Mike Speaker, uh, retired Lieutenant General Dave Halperson. Uh, Dave was a great friend and uh, been a great advocate. Uh, he was the head of the fire center at the artillery school and the air defense school when they started to merge that fire concept together to have both offense and defense together. He went on to be the deputy commander of TRADOC, a, a document. Um, so he, he's been ahead of the game here on where this gap has been. Uh, he ended his career as the uh, installation commander of all U.S. Uh, Army bases uh, around the world. Um, Dave? Well, thanks. Uh, first of all, you know, it's, it's great to be here. It's a great seeing Glenn. Uh, it's, uh, I appreciate the invite. Glenn, it's good to see you again. As, as always, um, I know we've been slugging this thing out for a few years, and uh, I think it's really important to kind of put it into that strategic context of what Glenn kind of said, because there is no reason why we just give away TORAD, right? Why would you do that? I mean, a lot of us uh, grew up in uh, uh, grew up in uh, Germany uh, during the Cold War. Uh, battery Command had a nuclear weapons back then with the young uh, artillerists and uh, understood the responsibility that we had. But the strategic context is just like what Glenn kind of laid out. It's historically based, like you said, and it is a risk that uh, everyone took. Uh, the bottom line, though, is uh, you know I was the chief of plans at the same time when 9/11 happened. So when you talk about writing two X words, understanding what the joint and the you know combined effects of what you have to do, you understand it about the air supremacy and air superiority at all the levels of things, right? And and it's very true. Effectively, really. May of 2003, we had air supremacy. General Mosley could, could declare that in Iraq. Uh, but at the beginning of that, trust me, General Mosley was not too excited about pushing a lot of stuff in there until he de defeated you know, the Iraqi Taliban, just like uh, Glenn said. He had to create the dominance of airspace to allow them to maneuver the force. So it was a very unique aspect of just like he was saying that how do you do that? So the challenge you have is just like you said, since about May of 2003, we've had this air supremacy. And when you have air supremacy, then when budgetary things take off, guess what happens? Thus, the Army grew from and had to be decreased. And so there's no evil people here. There's just the realities. What do I need? How do, we, how do we deal with this as we work for other joint enablers? So I think what we really have to be understand is put it in historical context, and then how do we, how do we, how, how do we fix it? How do we turn it? So when you talk to General Goldstein and stuff like that, when he was the ACC and we used to have discussions, he would sit there and go, you know, we really got to stress our folks because we need to be degraded as we sit there and fight through the IS. I'm losing capability within our air power to be able to understand what they used to do when they used to do all their air exercises and stuff. Understand the complexity of what the, what the enemy can do to that. And it's just like, you know, uh, we've heard now with the three R's, you know, that General Milley always talks about, you know, but. The Russian threat, just like Glenn you know, highlighted, it's a reality. They invested in a, a, a few great places. One, electronic warfare, right? Which is very huge. So if you ever think that you're going to be able to radio without people understanding you know, what's going on, they, they're going to be able to do things. They've invested in the space. They're going to be able to have capabilities to be able to understand. They've invested in long-range fire and things, so we're outgunned. They're into that 70 kilometer with two artillery and two much longer range fires. And just like what Glenn said, in cause, you know, the, the study that folks have done uh, on reference, uh, you know, uh, the, the effects of the e Ukraine, you know, uh, you know uh, war and what happened in a few short hours, kind of put the starkness of, you know, what, what do we need to do now? So that's the gap. So, you know, really from what us, and we had to be the, the, the shore at Poland Force in this thing from built there. When the budget for the Army dropped from $250 billion a year in, in 2010 <coughs> to $125 billion it is now, guess what? Structure, because 51% of these people, it was just the cost. But that risk now is something that they're going to have to uh, in, invest in. And I think that's really where Glenn and I uh, were coming to, is that it's going to take time, and it's going to do it, but... What everyone's telling us right now in Europe, we got to do something now. So just like before, you go into battle just like the way you are, not what you want to be. And you have to be prepared. So they've had to come up with solutions to be able to fix this, you know, conundrum or this dilemma that they have. 
And it is fixable, just like the Brickley kind of said, because this is not a U.S. issue. You know what I mean? I think we have more combat brigades in Europe than the, 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 the Germans do, right? <laughs> From a capability perspective and what they have to do. So therefore, this is a collective issue of re reference to what, uh, what we have to do with near peer competitors, people that actually have true capability to threaten our way of life. Because there are certain people that did not give up tactical nukes. There are certain people that did not let go because they didn't have to fight. These folks have means that have been threatening our way of life. And that's the stark reality of then how do we fix this thing. From an army perspective, I think this, uh, you know, this you know, operational environment, kind of like Ren, what you're talking about, is really important. And we're really working hard. You know, I'm, a, I'm the, 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 the deputy and advisor with uh, Brian McKiernan, the fire center, and, and Glennon and stuff. And how do we sit there and try to think through these issues? The first is, like anything, you gotta say, we got a probability to fix it. And I think we're on this path, just like you said, we have to bring everyone because Glenn and I were talking just before we got here. I said, Glenn, man, I remember when you sit there and told me about, you know, just for the NASCO mission, we needed so many battalions. And they kept on saying, how do you do it cheaper, quicker? He goes, well, sir, you know, for National Guard, we're on one to five. If this is a requirement. I need so many, I need headquarters to be able to then synchronize the effects that we have. It's just not the units themselves, it's also the headquarters that allow us the capability to do planning, to do things that are under attack. So I think. The three things that we have to look at how we're going to try to fix this thing and where we have to go is one, institutionally. And when I'm talking about institutionally, that's obviously at the fire center. So how do you recruit, you know, air defense? How do you train folks to a muscle set that they are not? We understand it because we used to have show rad. You know, I was an F8 battalion when I was a lieutenant. Guess what? We used to have red eye. You know, uh, yeah. you know, right in there right in our formations that we can sit there and integrate with the capabilities of, of, of our things like the room aid or the red eye zoom aid. And then we went to the battalions and then we went to the fight for capability. So what I'm saying is that those folks, i.e. General Milley, remember when he was a brigade commander in 2004. <coughs> so he's been in this environment. So institutionally, we have a whole set of war fighters that we have to be able to understand is the collective layer defense, just like what Glenn said, from the national stuff of MDA into the operational aspect of Patriot into the SHORAD aspect protects echelonment of that. We've always said air defense is a layered approach. It gives us the capability. It's kind of like when you deploy a fad, you, you better protect it with some Patriot or guess what, you may have a bad day. Because if I'm the enemy, guess what I'm looking for? I'm looking for that system. So I think institutionally, we're really going to have to invest in one in the fire center and to ensure that from our leader development perspective and from our doctrinal perspective and from our things, we get it right. So we can enroll the people that then can understand the effects and the complexities that the I would say that it takes for air missile defense and it takes for air defense artillery to be deployed properly. So, so would you would you look at putting the bars, putting missile defense back into the bars? Would you put them back in the cores? Are you going to give a well, I think, I think Brian, Brian McKinnon and the fire centers, they work their operational concepts are looking at both things. One, in the F, in, in the I, I, the what you have at the brigade level, what you have at the, at the, at the division uh, level, and then what you have in the operational or the core level. Each one has a certain opportunity that you have to be able to do. But what's emerging clearly from the doctrinal writings of the fire concept that Brian and them have done is that you have to have electronic warfare, you have to have IO, you have to have uh, fires, offense and defensive fires, to be effective against what the enemy is going to do to you. So those formations at the set, and it's not set yet what they're going to be, but you're going to see formations uh, that it, 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 it is going to move forward. So in, uh, institutionally, the fire centers have started investment uh, in, in what this is, Randy McIntyre and them have started to flush out exactly what it is, and they're going to be briefing, you know, the, 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 their, I would say their course of actions, as, as, as Glenn knows, of, What's the right about mix uh, to the senior leaders to make sure they get it right? And so, for uh, as you well know, that the shore ad issue, as you know, is divisional below. So it's an, an issue of the Patriot Force has always been in echelon that's above. So this echelon that's above issue is always very important. I'm not talking about tribal issues, right? <laughs> but but um, it's the reality that we have to be able to do that. And that's what's good you know, that's about the fire centers that they can bring all that together to make sure we have the capability that we do need. 
The second thing is I think that, you know, uh, uh, with the, just like that, we're going to have to exercise. I mean, the institutional have to produce the leaders that can do it. I'm telling you, the Air Force is not going to give us free reign if they have, when they have sorties out there just with, you know, a bunch of folks, you know, certified on Stinger missiles or other things. They're going to they're gonna require a little bit more confidence that the, the environment is right. And I think they should. I mean, you know, so I think what we're going to have to work it through is we're going to have to work through all this stuff to make sure we've got the trained people at the level of responsibility with the command and control that can understand this, and then doctrine we work this in the combined arms team. And I think those are really what is important because the diversity of each capability that you bring to a war plane, just like we talk about diversity is the strength of America, right? It's the strength of, of what we are from a joint war fighting perspective and a combined arms army perspective. Because right now we're at the razor's edge, be it Air Force, Navy, Army, Marines, of what the capability is, we need everyone to do that. And that's why I think between us, that diversity of respecting what the Air Defense Force and what they do is going to be very important to, to the protection. We're going to have to do things quickly now, but institutionally we're going to have to do this. And that's not going to be an easy investment. It's going to take a long term. And I guess what I'm really telling you is this ain't going to turn overnight. It's going to have to be a long term investment be able to move this forward from an intermediate short term to a mid-term to a longer term approach of what we need from a sensor perspective but from a from a, a capability perspective to, to, to ensure that the shore rat capability the mobile and renewable shore rat capability gets back into its formation so we can protect and have the maneuver force to, to do allow them to do what they need to do Institutionally also, and Ricky kind of mentioned it, it's just not the U.S. institution. We have to be brought a part of a broader international community. And this is where it really gets into the NATO and, and them setting up a, their own center of excellence and how they deal with this issue of uh, air missile defense and, and you know, shore rat. Because what they do have in Europe is they have a lot of other capabilities that you need to leverage. So the need for them to be part of this and to create centers of excellence there to assist them and their allies, just like we've done with other allies, are going to be very important. So we have the dialogues, we have the, the training so they can grow their folks. And, and, uh, because I was at the ceremony when, when uh, you know, the Germany did their transformation on their, on their, uh, on their forces with the, within air missile defense. And it's going to be important for us to reestablish those uh, institutional uh, means to be working together so we can leverage all the players in the European and they do have capability, but now how do you integrate that capability to make sure we have the, 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 the capability is going to be very important because, as you know, the life insurance policies we gave them for their freedom, we've been doing a lot of heavy lifting there. And it needs to be part of them, so they have, they have skin in the game, as they call it in football. And they need to have that skin in the game to be part of the solutions and, and, and get the authorities and get the re responsibility so they can actually protect, you know, the means, the ports of entry, all those types of things institutionally that we used to do back in the old days when we were in, in, in Germany. Whatever exercise now we used to do in the 40s, what are those exercises where you have to, to deal with threats? What are those key, uh, uh, you know, flexible deterrent options or things that you need to be able to protect, you know, uh, you know and have the freedom of access to, to be able to be a deterrent of what's facing you? Very, very important. From a capability, and I think Glenn, you kind of highlighted, there's going to be an immediate fix that they have to do, be it, you know, training people, be certified, uh, on uh, you know your approach of what they want to do with you know uh, with the stingers and uh, other capabilities, they're going to have to do that from a capability perspective. As you heard, like uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, uh, Ricky kind of talked about the get pick, still a program. They have the capabilities. We're going to be able to adapt that because that's a layered approach. What it is, it has to it has to be adapted. But it is going to be something where in today's thinking, through the senior leaders, maneuvering is how you stay alive. Just like with with uh, what Glenn said. Uh, if you stay sta uh, you know, stationary, you're, you're setting yourself up. So how do you sit there, maneuver, have the freedom of things to be able to, to survive? Uh, it's gonna be a mixture of lethal and non-lethal. You want something that's, back in the old days, I used to have a Jeep. You know, I'm getting old here. <laughs> you know, people buy Jeeps now just for refurbishment. So. But guess what? We had no tarps on those Jeeps, right? And then what it taught me is that and this is, you know, we, we were protecting ourselves because UNS is, we were protecting ourselves with all fast movers and, you know, and helicopters and hinds and stuff to say, hey, how are we going to shoot those down with your fish weeds? We'd have to have training ranges. 
all those types of stuff that we know can compete in unison. It's everyone's responsibility to be the eyes, the ears, the everything to have an integrated air medical defense and to destroy that capability. That's what's designed. We're gonna have to do the same thing and, and so from a lethal and a non-lethal means to have that capability that can be multi-purpose. Because trust me, the old uh, the old uh, you know uh, 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 battalions of uh, some of the best gunners we had on the on the on the, on the uh, to be able to shoot down stuff was the old uh, you know uh, the guns we had on the air defenders, high penetrating, high speed that could be used for soft targets that was we called it in the Cold War days. Very important and uh, and, and very important. I think those are the means that we have to make sure when we bring that capability into the shoreline force where they have common operating picture, they have confidence of, uh, of uh, what's going on, and then they have a legal and non-legal means to ensure that they have either a local or a longer effect of that protection that we're doing. And I think that capability always leads into, uh, and you hear a lot of pressure on, on NATO and stuff to you know, you know give up their investments and stuff and, and look at themselves. In that capability, uh, Europe also needs to modernize and to be a, a part of that process so we can apply that capability. They have to be committed to the modernization, just like they said, or the, as the men would say, uh, they're gonna have to deal with the consequences, which is which is, 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 is the worst thing. I think then, you know, so so from an institutional side, what we do at the schoolhouse and how we apply that and, and train our leaders and certify that our people are, you know, are trained and ready to, and, and that's just not on the ABA side, it's also with maneuvers to understand what their capabilities at that level. Then into the organ, uh, capability sides of how do we modernize the near term and, and into the far term are going to be very, very important. Then the fat last thing is going to be the organizational change. We're going to have to be organizational. And in today's environment, it's not going to be where we're going to grow a whole bunch of headquarters. We're going to grow capability, and, and the chief, there's the number one thing that the chief wants fixed. So trust me, there's going to be organizational structure added into this because the chief knows that we're taking too much risk. It'll have to be, be competed, and we'll have to see what goes on the TA in 2024 and stuff like that, but the sensings are that they're gonna grow this capability and, and we're gonna have the means back, because as the Army grows, as we gain the you know, congressional capability, it's gonna be important for us to have this stuff. And, and, and all the discussions I've had is that the Army is very focused on ensuring that they have the, the means and the organizational things in set. So you'll see that not only at the Division Fires Command, to the fires battalion, to the operational at the core level, you're gonna see this fusion of capabilities that they're want, which will have electronic warfare, will have cyber, will have all these types of offense and defensive beings with a capability, just like with the, the, Sol I mean, the Russians do with their strike force, capability that they can provide as enablers to what's going on. That's gonna be really important. And I think really, you know, Glenn, if you, you kind of said like that, the WMDC thing, I think that's that shaping that we have to even do in Europe. What is that right structure? Because we've been down, you know, we've you know, always been struggling with uh, the WMDC there being a colonel and how do, we, how do we highlight that to a higher level to be a general officer flag and then how do we bring the allies and forth to make it their issue. It's gonna be very, very vital to us to get, make sure we have the right leadership at all levels so therefore we can we can bring the effects of their missile defense and destroy that capability that has been lost. It is going to be a market that needs to the, the, the best and brightest to try to solve to ensure that we don't put our soldiers at risk. Because the challenge the chief has and the challenge our country has is that is time. General Hodges can say, "I'm making thirty thousand and look like three hundred thousand, right?" I mean, who's heard Ben say that? Raise your hand. Man. If I'm a Russian general, I personally know I'm thinking 30,000 is 30,000. And I have interior lines, and I'm pretty happy. So I just have to make, when, when do I want to, when do I want to do it? Just like with North Korea. When you sit there and have the interior lines, you have the means and the capability. Now it's a strategic chess game of when I want to do it. So time is our most important thing that we're having to deal with, to build the capacity, to maintain uh, the capability uh, so we can be a, a viable option there in the reassurance and the deterrent aspect there in the European. So I think it's, an ex it's an exciting time because this capability, we're gonna need the best and the brightest to be able to serve in all three lines of effort that I talked about. The organizational, the institutional, and the capability lines, all there, and it's gonna be the collective efforts of our coalition and our 
Now the total force uh, capability that we're going to need to be successful. So that's, that's all I have. Right. Thanks, thanks, Dave. Um, I'm going to open it up. I'm going to start off with the first question. Get to ask Glenn if I can. Uh, from from my perspective, I think the, there are three major obstacles, and and it's not uh, funding. I think that's common. It's not uh, the mission that's common. I think the first one, and I had a chance to uh, hear Todd Walters, who's the uh, USAFE commander, who all missile defense reports to, but he's he's saying that we're, we're at junior varsity right now in, in our air defense capability, and that he that going forward we have to have C three command. Uh, he's not going to let anything go forward, right? No matter how good it is, if it's not. So how how do we get that's so that's the number. How do we get everybody comfortable at the AOC level and the Air Force that you got this thing down? <coughs> The, um, the second thing is, when's the last time we actually exercised SORAD with the maneuvering force or, or anywhere? When, when's the last time we actually put everything together, the sites together, and demonstrate that, including air power? So not, not just SORAD's a whole ball of wax. When is that coming? And, and is, or how long ago have we not done that? And I think the, 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 third, the third challenge um, is our, our acquisitions. I mean, uh, we're, we're struggled, we're challenged with, with, with getting things out in the field. And we, we don't have that time, as Dave said. How, how are we gonna increase uh, our capability into the field quicker than what, what, what it looks like is gonna be three or four or five years from now to fill this gap? So that, those, are the, I don't know, those are three things, you can comment on those three, or would it be great, then we just open it up for everybody else. To, uh, and, and the point that, that Brittany made about you know, the Air Force really is is number one component as far as when it comes to air defense. Your your number Air Force commanders, your three stars, but also your area air defense commanders. I work for three area air defense commanders in, in uh, North Carolina. Uh, First Air Force, General Williams, uh, the CAG Canadian Air Division, and then the, the 11th Air Force up in, up in Alaska. So I am their deputy because I handle the, the ground component of the overall air defense. So when you talk about the third air force in Europe, you know, and right now there's, um, there's a push to turn um, infantry guys into air defenders. You know, it is, it is a, a, a stop gap because right now we need air defenders. So we're gonna train to a July of a, of a five week July to train these guys to do what an air defender has learned over, or, or, or you know, really started his craft and, and increased his knowledge about his craft over in five weeks. So the problem that I would have if I was an Air Force commander, matter of fact, it's a problem I would have if I'm an, an Army aviator, you know, is do I want to fly over an area where I have people that maybe not trained to, to as, as far as uh, identification, you know, do they have the ability to use sensors? And who's gonna, who's gonna command control the, the, you know, the weapon systems on the ground? You know, I think right now we're, we're looking at a lot of young kids who that we're gonna scare the hell out of by telling us that we don't own the airspace. And so if I hand a, a 22 year old private a weapon system that now he can command the airspace, you know, how do I control that, that, that soldier? And I think this is one of the issues we're gonna have because we have lost generations of trained air defenders working with maneuver force. Our, our battalion commanders and brigade commanders have not ever worked with sure at. So how do we integrate these, these neighbors back into the force? You know, how do we get out of a FOB mentality is, you know, I fight for a day and I go back and, and sleep behind the escrow. You know, how do we increase this, this field craft? How do we how do we integrate our air defenders? It's just not the air defenders, but it's our FA units back into this this total maneuver piece. Uh, we are trying to work out, you know, of course, we have the NTCs, the National Training Centers. But right now, the, the National Training Centers have been, you know, over the last 15 years, have never had to work with air defense. You know, so the skills that these people have, these, these young captains, they just don't have anymore. You know, and we're still using the old the old threat set, but to do it, the old threat set is the current threat set. 
you know, it's Task Force Angel with, with the use of helicopters, it's the Heinz, it's the fun radiation. So how do we integrate people who have never worked before and people who have never had to, to identify what a threat is? You know, so, yeah, you know, I agree with, with part of what, what the CSA wants to do, is, you know, it's, it's a stop game. I've got to get a weapon system out there. I've got to gain the confidence, and what it is, it's, it's really not, not a, a um, trying to get these guys as air defenders, it's really a confidence in the fact that, yes, that I can, I do have a system that I can to help me enable my maneuver. You know, it, and that's why we've, we've come up, um, especially with the National Guard, you know, when we deploy the TANG into, into the NCO uh, to do the, the National Capital, you know, in essence, it doesn't take a whole battalion. And so what we are looking at is, is along with that battalion, that we will deploy a battery to Europe to work with the BCT. And to me, the main focus of that battery is to instill the confidence into the leadership of the brigade and the tank, the ability for them to, to learn and to, and to be taught how to use air defense. How to, how to use air defense to, to allow them freedom of maneuver. That's what, we, that's what we're there for. You know, we are an for freedom of maneuver. And so if we can, if we can provide a standoff from, from Russian aviation, rifle frontal aviation, Russian UASs, you know, we can allow that freedom of maneuver. But it, it's not been something that, that General Halverson said, it's something that we're not gonna be able to teach within a year or two. You know, there's a lot of institutional knowledge that we have lost. When I have lieutenants from the National Guard who go out to the schools, you know, they come back more trained on Patriot than they do mature at. And that's one thing that Randy McIntyre is, 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 is re-looking how we train soldiers. We need to get back into the dirt. We need to go back into, into how we work with our infantry and our armor, provide them the air protection. And to me, arming 11 Bravos, and I'm 11 Bravo, and I'll, and, and I'll tell you a quick story. When I was, when I was a lieutenant, you know, they gave us an, an air defense unit, it was a red-eye um, section, and I was out of the NTC. You know, and I was in the, 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 the 24th Division, and, and we used to get these, these captains coming out of the range of the tank, and knew absolutely nothing about mechanized infantry. You know, some things I always scratch my head about. But he asked me, he says, well, what, what, what do I give these guys? You know, what, what, what does an air defense unit do for us? I said, well, sir, you know, I just came out of Fort Benning, and uh, we put them on high terrain, and they provide this umbrella over our forts. He said, well, good, find a nice hill, and put them on that hill. <laughs> so, two and a half weeks into the, op into the operation, he says, um, whatever happened to those air defenders? I said, sir, they're, they're still back on that hill, providing air defense. It's because we weren't trained how to use air defenders, and that's how the Army is right now. So it's that institutional knowledge that we need. You know, it's how we work the branches together, not, not working branches separate, and then try to throw these guys together at a national training event. It's how do we start forming the relationships. I'm gonna say something that I shouldn't say, but I, I am not a fan of Mark Laird. I believe that units need to have associations. I don't like to be thrown with a unit that I haven't worked with. You know, I don't like to show up like General Harrison would say on the 20 yard line, also make a new kicker or a new quarterback. That doesn't work for me. We need to integrate these forces and work together so we are an army of one. Now we get back to, um, oh, now I got off track, I tell you, Air Force. Air Force ain't gonna be crazy about guys out there. Um, acquisition, we are working on acquisition, we're working on, on how to increase the, the lethality of our system right now. Uh, we've had some successful testing of the prox fuse, which adds or uh, increases the capability of our Avengers to be able to go at uh, UASs and, and other type of, uh, uh, of systems. And, and I think pretty soon they're going to be testing new missiles, which is going to be a missile shoot off to see, you know, what missiles we need. What do we really need? What does this thing need to look at? 
What capabilities do we need? You know, what's a requirement? We have the requirement, now we just need the, the capabilities. And then it goes into field, and what do we feel? You know, I think we need to get away from fixed, you know, from, from defending from fixed platforms. You know, we cannot fight strategic fights how we fought the last two wars. I don't think the Russians are going to allow us to set up Tesco's, you know, and, and do the, you know, the, do the Afghan thing of I load up a truck and I go out and fight for a day and I, and I come back for a hot meal at night. You know, we should not operate like that. And we've got to change the mindset that, you know, we need to go back into a fluid battlefield. Go back into the old airline battle. You know, how do I fight? And I think once we change the way we feel about fighting, then we'll take a look at these enablers, the offensive fighters, the defensive fighters that we need. You know, and then we'll have an integrated force that, you know, the Russians will say, I'm not gonna mess with those guys. You know, I might have, I might have long range precision, but these guys know how to protect their, their forces on the field. And so I don't wanna lose people testing the American army. And that's where we need to be. Well said, well said. All right, we'll open up for questions. I'm not sure that we do see a question, but uh, and I'm hearing uh, General Brown, uh, General Ellison, and you, maybe, if I'm, it's almost my story of my life. Uh, <laughs> I'm one of the people that someone left in the some mountain and <laughs> later on become. But really, uh, something happened in the technology point of view, and uh, that somehow, let's say that General Bomber uh, presented in his words, skip the dirt and go to the uh, uh, centralized set, uh, weapon system, let's call it. Off tech years, whatever. Uh, we are talking about today, we have different interceptor, or different type, uh, different communicating capability, command control, sensor, something that those days that we, when we operated, Red eyes, the Volcom, the Caporal, whatever mm -hmm. was in the inventory, was non almost non-relevant. We don't have, we didn't have. And uh, today, if we are looking for show a system, I think that we have a lot of assets. We have a lot of things that we can adapt, and we should adapt in this. Uh, but now coming the next question, what is the threat that we would like to be uh, that, that we uh, should be? And uh, I would like to raise, to recommend, maybe we should adapt some definition of the need. That the short should be a close in weapon system. And as General Obama said, we should protect our forces, the soldiers. So maybe the mission of the Shoah should be not to deal with the platform, to deal with the ammunition. And I put in the same category the USD and US in the same. So this is the system that we should use. Not to deal, to leave the platform for long range weapon system that we build or for aircraft or whatever. We should uh, create some umbrella that will be the last belt of protection to the military. Yeah. And this is the aspect. But then I think General Allison um, Presented and I also General Brown said it. How we train, maintain these forces during the meantime between wars? 
this is the really if you are looking what happened to why the shore the short system disappeared. And I look on the Israeli uh, air defense, what happened? Really you didn't you don't know what to do with these forces in time in three wars. You don't know how to train. And I had an opportunity that once you have a situation that short system has to fire between wars, it's, it's not so simple. It's, it's very difficult. More than to sit in command control, to sit uh, what and to fight. Now you have to identify. And uh, this is a uh, how to train these soldiers, how to teach these soldiers, how to maintain them. This is the enemy of the Shorat resistance because really. Unlike artillery, unlike uh, tanks that you fight against what? From time to time you're uh, firing against drones, against rockets, against aircraft. Take the, uh, for example, every air defender who can finish his service at the Patriot, how many, how many missiles he fired during his service? Zero. What is the feeling to fire? You don't know. And we know, time to time, we have uh, some situations that someone fired by accident off missile, you didn't recognize that he fired. And just left. So this is the, these are the challenges. And first of all, we have to define against what? What is the threat right now? I, I do think, you know, I think from, from us, we see the evolving threat, so the useful capabilities or the cultural capabilities from the operating conscience, I think now are, we are moving towards this threat base, obviously Russia's been highlighted to some, along with other players, now there's turned their activity to boxes, but I do think we've got to continue to do that in motion, so at the MTC, JRTC's, home station training, all these things have to be inculcated into their abilities, because the natural tendency, like you said, is that uh, you uh, you won't train them, right? So you, they won't have, and it is expensive. So we, we're going to have to look at means of high version construction, immerse them in the environment, and restart it just like we do with tank crews with their batteries and, and the immersion like that. We have to create systems for our air and our fighters to be able to be immersed. It, it, it's so noble. So, like you're saying, it's it's very very important uh, because a lot of assets the CFAC will have to use to take on the air to air threat before he can then provide the thing. So McNair Hall at Fort Sill is a good good, good name for the reason, right? He was he was working the difference between strategic bombing and close air support. And then he, he died in here <laughs> observing that. But all I'm telling you is that we're gonna have to continue to, to immerse them in the device and train them. Just like Glenn said, I think it's good. It takes time because, uh, and, and what you want to be able to do is respect uh, the, the capabilities you, and I think the immersion into the, the maneuver and get the, the confidence like uh, Glenn said is going to be important. So we have a generation now that, that has air supremacy that has not had to work with us, so we're going to have to continue the dialogue, and, and that's why I think the institutional will be very important along with the whole combined army team to be able to, to, to dialogue. Cause Trust me, Cold War, our poor Hawk guys are getting fired all the time, right? Yeah. yeah and they're not being <laughs> Shorat guys, right? I mean, I mean that was a real, a real challenge out there because you're on every mountainside in, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in Europe and stuff like that. So we're, we're, this is one we have to do. So like Brick, if we, you know, we're going to have to press just like MRAPs or something like that. We're going to have to press the acquisition side to facilitate, uh, like uh, Glenn said, the, the total force and to join together to combine the solution set that we're going to have to be able to work through. So get the common operating picture, like you said, so they have themselves and these assays and all these things that we've done with, you know, uh, working with the aviation and all this stuff, so we have a clearer picture and we gain that confidence and, and, and hopefully we can put together.
that takes care of the leadership. Take the leadership. Yeah. Yeah. Different type of leadership. Yeah. And like I said, we have to let's uh, like we gotta go get it. We have to go get it. I think that's one of the things we I would say we have to push. Um, you know, uh, uh, just it, and then I mean it's down to that iterate. You know, I mean, but I think between you lethal and non-lethal, and then going to the multi-task thing, just like uh, we said, Vulcan was. I mean, yeah. I mean every maneuver guy loves a Vulcan. You know, because you know. Uh, he can apply it. Uh, with uh, other things uh, as the threat uh, develops. Uh, yeah, it's kind of getting said around the table. Um, is there a timeline on the shore ride batteries right now? Shore battery to Europe? Yeah, to Europe. The one that are, you know, from the shore that are I think, right I think we're looking at uh, getting a, a storage unit uh, probably in the spring of 18. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I want to piggyback a little bit on that prior question. Um, I mean, historical example, obviously, is World War II. We're defending against aircraft. But the, uh, and we talked about adventures and stingers or aircraft oriented sort of systems. But if you look at the modern battlefield, and you alluded to this in your description of the Russian piece of uh, uh, UAV. You, you get all this almost sort of seamless aircraft, a long range UAV, to shorter range drones, to swarms, to rockets, artillery, and mortars. And now you're sort of getting out of Shorad, you're into something else, which sort of gets back to the notion of close in weapon system versus longer range thing. So if you could talk a little bit more about that uh, much more complicated threat environment and how that affects sort of the range of organizational and Material solutions, I think that would be helpful. I mean, I, I would just say, I mean, coming from my, my trade off, you're exactly right. I mean, the most important thing we have to do is uh, maneuver and uh, warfare is all about time and space, right? And so you can't protect everything. That's why you always have to prioritize. You have to be able to integrate. You have to be able to do it. So I would sit there to say, you have to be able to do it. I think that's why Glenn said you have to have some maneuverable force because. You're going to have to give that commander capability to be able to provide it. So the static wings aren't going to be there. And then it's going to be a time and space issue that gives you then that capability. So how much time do you need at that company level or at the time level, infantry brigade level? Those are the capabilities that the brigade commander will need slash uh, division commander in order to be able to do these views. So I think I think that's what we're looking for. But, you know, uh, you know, one, you know, how do I take something down that could be used uh, for one thing to give me a good air picture, and then the second time it can be used up to make sure whatever sector they're operating on is not work. You know, all these types of capabilities are going to be important for us to ensure that we can, yeah. we can do it or uh, to, to facilitate uh, that. The capabilities are on there, I mean, and I think what we need to be able to do is then just define that, getting that, getting that stuff down there. And, and I think one of the problems is, is we try to find one solution for everything. Yeah. You know, so we, we, we spend a lot of money trying to, to develop a system that can handle a, a whole spectrum of capabilities. And so when you start doing that, you, it's like you, you give me something that really cannot. Because the, the capabilities that our adversaries have has always been changed. And so one thing that needs to be done in, in uh, that discussion with General Milley is, is you know, the way we do procurement. Uh, procurement is, you know, and it gets into um, legacy procurement. You know, so we have an adversary who has a capability. You know, so we, so we start looking at, okay, that capability, it builds my requirement. So I need to build a capability to defeat his capability. But it is, and, and of course, then we have to go to, to industry and, and, uh, and allow the, you know, this, this Thing we call um, yeah, um, the, the, the government process. And so if you're giving me something that I needed for capabilities or requirements 10 years ago, but you're doing it today, you know, it, it's changed. You know, it's, it's an antiquated system. And you know, so we need to look at is, is, is and, and the, the problem with air defense is it's, it's expensive stuff. You know, if I want to shoot down a, you know, a drone that a kid can buy at a hobby store, 
I don't want to launch a million dollar missile against it. You know, so we need to look at the economics of, of, of battle and economics of war. You know, so so what is, what else is out there? You know, and as we get to not just air defense being an apron, but we look at how we use, you know, signal assets, uh, how do we use our intelligence assets, you know, is there ways that we can capture this thing or use non lethal uh, instead of always trying to put a bomb on something? Because if you get to that point, then it'll be just like the Cold War, where you outlet the Russians because they couldn't spend. And that's the way we'll do. Um, when people ask me, how do I do air defense as far as UAVs in the capital, it's like, well, I really don't. Because it's really not my job. It's, it's, it belongs to a number of law enforcement. You know, so we need to work with, with agencies. It's all interagency. And when you get into Europe, it's all, it's, it's working with other nations. What capabilities do they have? When we were in Slovakia, you know, I was amazed to see SA-6s and SA-10s maneuvering and providing airspace coverage, working with Patriot and working with Avenger, you know, and they were coming back with, with an integrated air picture. You know, so it can be done. You know, it might not be, you know, the, the technology that we're using today, it might be technology that they used 15, 20 years ago. But there's a way of integrating old systems into a, 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 a complex system. And, but a lot of countries there, but you just, you know, the, um, uh, the Hungarians, the Lithuanians, who have the old systems, really can't afford to go out and buy Patriot or buy a bag. And we don't have the ability to give them Patriot or bag. You know, so we need to work with what they have and integrate it. And I'll tell you what, um, my hat's off to, to Jen Eikhoff and the tent, WABC, because she has done yeoman's work of integrating systems. And when you can go there and you can, you can observe an exercise with multiple nations, and you have an integrated data picture, the, you know, the, the radars and the sensors are all seeing one thing, and you have one track number, that, that, to me, that's, you know, that, that's, that's, science that uh, is using old technology. But it gets back into innovation. You know, and, and I always coined the phrase, you know, innovation is, is, is the confluence, you know, of critical and creative thinking. And that's what it is. You know, it's not always getting the, the, the eight pound brain out there to get this thing out. It's getting this F4 or, or the warrant officer and say, hey, here's, here's a problem. Give me a solution. And they'll come up with a solution. You know, it might be using stuff that was done 15, 20 years ago. But there are ways of doing it, ways that we don't have to spend, you know, the, the, the national treasure we have, the money we have, you know, to, to hit, you know, a, a $2,000 target with a million dollar missile, but other ways of doing it. And that's what we need to do.